So we're now going to move to a panel discussion. We're thinking now um, about funding and about political mobilization in countries. So MMV has had something like 28 public, private, and um, philanthropic donors over the years, including 12 bilateral supporters. Um, and we're going to hear now from some of them in a discussion over the next 30 minutes or so. So I'd like to welcome up to the stage, um, uh, we have Jeremy Lefroy, um, head of the all-party parliamentary group in the UK for malaria and neglected tropical diseases, Robin Davis, the head of the Indo-Pacific Centre for Health Security in Australia, uh, Glaudina Lutz, the Director of Health Innovation at DST in South Africa, um, and Alex Schultz, head of Glo the Global Health Programme um, at SDC in Switzerland. Great, so welcome to the stage. And I think um, we'll, we'll begin, if we may, with, with some introductory reflections from each of you on a bit of the context, you know, how you mobilize support, where things are at in your respective countries and institutions around the focus of funding and support for tackling malaria. Jeremy. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you for all your support to our uh, group in the UK Parliament. When uh, Stephen O'Brien asked me to take over the all-party group on malaria and neglected tropical diseases, thanks, neglected tropical diseases in 2010 when I was elected uh, to Parliament, I had no hesitation in accepting, having had malaria several times myself uh, when living in Tanzania and being involved a little bit in, in the growing and production of artemisinin. Uh, but when I took on the chairmanship, I didn't realize just how important the work that Stephen and the group had done. This consisted of about uh, 20 parliamentarians in both houses of the UK Parliament. And it was supported and continues to be supported by MMV, by Malaria Consortium, uh, by Malaria No More Path, the UK Coalition Against NTDs, GSK and others. And we're very grateful for that because that allows us to have a strong programme throughout the year in Parliament, bringing together experts such as Pedro, who's been incredibly uh, supportive to us, and many uh, others, of, uh, and I'm sure many of you here present uh, have been there. The question is, is it effective? And I would just give a couple of examples. The first is... Uh, on the Global Fund. In 2010, uh, when I became chair, the UK was on average giving £190 million a year uh, to the Global Fund. At the recent uh, summit in Lyon, the UK pledged what turns out to be £465 million a year over the next three years from 2020 to 2023. And that, of course, is a huge reflection of the UK government's commitment um, but it reflects other things as well. Firstly, it reflects the effectiveness of the Global Fund. It reflects the 0.7% commitment of the UK government and indeed the £500 million a year commitment, which has lasted for the last 10 years. And I do think it shows that the advocacy of the three all-party groups involved, that of ours, of um, HIV, AIDS and of TB, has some influence uh, within Parliament. And I think the same is true with MMV. We've seen that uh, MMV is an incredibly effective way in which taxpayers' money, my constituents' money, can be used to tackle these issues. And parliamentary work is vital in every country. We work together with parliamentary groups in France, Germany, Switzerland, Tanzania, Uganda, Canada, the USA, and others. And these groups have the merit of being cross-party. And in some countries where cross-party work is extremely difficult, it is one of the few ways in which parliamentarians on opposite sides of the chamber can come together. And it's also really important to involve parliamentarians because they themselves can be advocates in their own constituencies. So last, uh, in September this year, I went with another UK parliamentarian and a German uh, member of the Bundestag, Volkmar Klein, to visit Tanzania at the invitation of the Tanzania All-Party Group. And they said how important it was that they did their work in their constituencies, sensitizing people to the importance of using insecticide-treated bed nets and taking up all the other uh, things that are available uh, to, to combat malaria. So my plea is, please do work with members of parliament. We are there to be helpful, although sometimes it may not seem uh, to be the case. I want to conclude 
with a, a visit that we had during um, a, a trip we had during that visit to a hospital just outside Dodoma, Mvumi Hospital. And um, my wife, Janice, who's here today, she had worked there in 1983, and we were met at the gates by the same two doctors from the UK who'd been working there in their youth and had now retired and come back to work there in their retirement. And Dr. Andrew Barclay, who ran the children's ward back in the 1980s, told us that the reflection of the progress made in tackling malaria was seen by when he was in charge in, 98, in the 1980s, the ward was overflowing with cases of severe malaria among children. Now it was only about one third full and they very rarely came across cases of severe malaria. And so I would just like to thank all of you here in the malaria community for the work that you have done to make that achievement possible. Thank you. So, Robin, perhaps, um, so you're, um, you're with the Indo-Pacific Centre for Health Security in Australia and also an honorary professor at Australian National University. Give us a, give us a bit of a sense of um, momentum around malaria in Australia and how it's been possible to mobilise support and funding. Yeah, I, I wanted to speak very much from an, an Asia-Pacific uh, perspective. Um, I mean, the Asia Pacific is a region where um, elimination is, is actually a, you know, a real and present opportunity. Um, at this point, only five or six percent of the world's malaria cases and deaths take place in the Asia Pacific. Um, some countries have achieved or are very close to achieving elimination status, as, as we just saw. Um, so that situation creates very real sort of challenges and opportunities. Um, and I want to focus just on a few of those briefly. Um, one is the challenge of complacency, of course, uh, in many countries that are, um, in some cases, not even that close to elimination. Um, the national malaria control programs really struggle for attention and struggle for resources. Um, so there's a need for um, support for national, regional leadership on malaria elimination. And that's certainly part of what we try to do, for example, through uh, hosting the inaugural World Malaria Congress a couple of years ago, through supporting the Asia Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance, and through supporting initiatives at the, the country and sub-regional level, particularly in uh, Melanesia. Um, so that kind of a focus on mobilising senior leadership for elimination is just essential in, in this region, even more so than, than in others. Then secondly, at the, the programmatic, the operational level, um, a lot of the new funding that we're operating with um, has been provided to us by the government under a health security heading banner. And uh, health security is a term that is sometimes criticised because it's seen as focusing excessively on transboundary threats to developed countries, and for the most part, those threats do not include malaria. Uh, however, we've taken a, quite a broad uh, concept of health security, which certainly does include support for action on endemic diseases, including malaria. And more importantly, when, when you think about how you need to operate in, uh, in the end stage, il in elimination mode, a lot of what you have to do in terms of surveillance and active case finding is very similar to what you would do if, if facing some entirely new pathogen. Um, so it makes a lot of sense to see malaria elimination in a health security context and that's, that's what we're doing and that's how we're using some of the resources that uh, we now have for uh, health security in the Indo-Pacific. And then finally, um, research and development is particularly fundamental in a region where I guess the, the easy part is increasingly being done and what you have left are some significant hard challenges. Um, one of those challenges was mentioned, the, um, the growth of uh, drug-resistant uh, malaria in the greater Mekong sub-region. Um, and the other is the increasing prevalence um, of Vivax malaria in our region. Um, so I just want to give you one little example of, of um, I guess, how we're using research and development resources um, to deal with that last challenge. 
So there have been many references already today to tofenoquine, um, the new drug for relapsing Vivax malaria. It's a drug that actually has a long association with Australia. Some of the early clinical trials uh, on, on that, that drug were undertaken uh, by the Australian Army Malaria Institute. Um, now, having achieved registration both in the US and in Australia, we've seen it uh, as important to now make it possible for countries to uh, register the drug uh, nationally and to provide support through our um, national medicines regulatory authority for them to do that. Um, and that, that has started with uh, a partnership between the TGA and the government of Thailand. Um, and we expect there will be further support um, to roll out to Fenequin across uh, the region. And this, this builds on many years of strong support from Australia for a suite of product development partnerships, none of which is stronger than the medicines for malaria venture. So we're trying to take a quite a holistic approach to research and development, focusing on the product development part, but then also moving on to the, the regulatory assistance part. I'll stop there. Great. So, so, Claudina, let's turn to South Africa and uh, obviously also a relatively low burden country, happily, for, for malaria, but nonetheless, some um, you've had long-standing commitment, funding and, and research, to, and I should say you're Director of Health Innovation at the Department of Science and Technology. So tell us how, um, how malaria fits in for you and your funding priorities and how you've been able to drive the agenda in the region. Well, South Africa's actually got a, a history of more than 100 years of being involved with vector control and so on. Things like your indoor residual spraying is actually to a large extent pioneered from South Africa. So the, we are lucky that we are at the bottom end of the malaria belt, to put it like that, but unfortunately we also have neighbors who are um, suffering from a high burden of malaria, so there are automatically some spillovers that you need to contain. As you've seen with the previous speaker, uh, we're not going to make it to 2020 since we are still sitting at around about 18,000 cases per annum. We had 120 deaths from that. A number of them are imported from our neighboring countries. So based on the abilities that we have developed over the years, a lot of emphasis is put into vector control, but we cannot, uh, one of the things is we stopped using DDT in the 1990s and immediately the malaria so shot up to over 60,000 cases and so they had to reintroduce uh, um, DDT again to, to control it. So what is also important that the mosquito because it's more now malaria is through arabiensis and the patterns is different. It's outdoor patterns and no more indoor patterns. You need to start looking at larvae sites and, and what to do around that. So one of the areas that we are actually now actively pursuing is actually the sterile insect technology because we do have the ability on the nuclear side to, to do that. And we've released three uh, colonies already around the borders to see to what extent we can create a mosquito-free zone. <laughs> um, so also you, my colleague, Professor Chibali, was in the previous group. So we also put a lot of emphasis on drug development um, and the collaborations that's been achieved through that with our colleagues in Ethiopia that is actually involved with the phase two. Um, is, is one of the things we, we, we are very proud of, that we can do research in Africa for Africa and to take it forward from that. The collaboration with MMV is approximately 10 years. It's actually before the uh, EPIC meeting in Heathrow. It is actually through the African, when we were trying to put together the African Network for Drugs and Diagnostics Innovation, ANDI, we actually met Jeremy and had started to have discussions around that. We, so yes, we, we're trying to see what we use our resources in South Africa and to see how we can take it forward. One of the problems is we, because of the drug resistance to SP, 
uh, we actually immediately had to move on to using Guartem now as the first line of treatment for, um, for malaria cases as such. So thanks. So, so Alex, let's turn to you. So you're head of the Global Programme for Health at SDC, the Swiss Agency of Development and Cooperation. Got a number of different priorities, but malaria is in there. I mean, set the scene. Obviously, Switzerland's also been active for a long time in, in research um, around malaria, but also funding. So how does that fit? How easy is that case to make and maintain or to build? Thanks, Andrew. Um, going back probably to 1999, when we started with DFID, I think the first donors for, for MMV, I think there would, for me, there are two elements, and, and probably even by then, what we would call nowadays the comparative advantage, I think that was one of the criteria to say, you know, we should also engage in terms of funding from the governmental public side uh, in, in malaria. So, and I, I think that has evolved when you look at the different centers. I mean, the, the Swiss Tropical Public Health Institute has been mentioned a few times. We've seen the, the very impressive story around Coatem. You know, I used to work for the Novartis Foundation, so I was very close to, to the ex-colleagues at Novartis. So we've got the different players working at different ends, and I think that was already clear in the beginning of 2000s that there is some sort of Swiss comparative advantage, especially as a rather smaller donor, you know, the question arises at least twice, where should you invest, where can you make a difference? And I think that was based on, you know, scientific knowledge and know-how uh, through to the pharmaceutical companies, but also in public research institutes. The second bit, I probably allude a little bit to what the colleague from, from, from the UK said, it's quite similar in Switzerland, basically to sustain that sort of focus also on malaria within the wider global health space is certainly a good organization within civil society but across sectors so we basically have a Swiss malaria group in Switzerland and what I think is a unique that they bring the private sector civil society around NGOs and the, the scientific community together and I guess they've got two big priorities one is advocacy to keep malaria high on the agenda and then they are in constant contact with parliamentarians. They also went to countries to have a look and that engage in what it concretely means. But the second thing is also some sort of technical exchange about more specific questions within malaria, be it you know more from the research side, to build an understanding, for example, on the NGO side, what it, does it mean, what does it take to introduce new products, and what you have to think through, also the science side, you know, when we talk about exit, what does it mean? Is it just the developed product or what are the other steps when we go uh, downstream in terms of exit? So I, I think these two elements played a lot for our engagement. Now looking forward to finish probably, um, we have what we call the framework credit in Switzerland for four years. That's the credit this parliament gives for international cooperation. And we see the next period will be 21 to 24. There will be a shift, you know, it's good in terms of the agenda 2030 and more that spirit of not looking at single pieces anymore. So the four priorities will follow the four Ps, planet, prosperity, people and peace. And then the question will be how do we insert smartly, for example, malaria and the global health agenda in these topics? I mean, people will be one one area, clearly save lives and provide essential services. So it does fit. But I think we probably need to build even more the case, for example, for malaria. What is the contribution to one of or several of these priorities in, in terms of Swiss comparative advantages, what can be put within malaria so that we basically uh, push forward one, two, three, or even four of these objectives, because I guess it's not only limited to save lives and provide essential services. And that means, I think, also to work more across sectors, you know, also our community here, think of how can we work with the education sector, how can we possibly combine two or three SDGs in one go, and not just think health, uh, SDG 3. So I guess looking forward, that will be one very important element, and the other one, obviously, is within the health se sector to think of solutions that probably not only tackle malaria, but have got a bit of the UHC uh, perspective. You know, when I think of diagnostics, wonderful work is going on in terms of electronic decision trees around the causes of fever. So if we look at causes of fever as the entry point, we are not just with malaria, but we would look at different infectious diseases. And I guess these are the tools and 
avenues we need to pursue in terms of an Agenda 2030 logic that doesn't just stick with one disease uh, and, and has a bit of a broader perspective and probably you know, also will increase a little bit cost effectiveness uh, because we know we have other challenges waiting outside, you know, non-communicable diseases, and we have to tackle them somehow. So what does it mean for, you know, these, these uh, topics like malaria, um, if we want to stain them high on the agenda, I think we have to show what is the contribution to other SDGs and what is the contribution to EHC and where can we also increase cost effectiveness of our interventions from R&D to downstream access. So, Jeremy, does that, does that resonate in terms of trying to, you know, broaden out, in a sense, from a few vertical diseases to the wider UHC or the still broader SDG agenda in terms of mobilising political support? Do you face some of those same challenges with AP, the APPG? Very much so. And when we've uh, been trying to talk about, for instance, contributions to the Global Fund uh, in Parliament, we've stressed very much the importance of joined-up working, of health systems, and indeed I work very, our all-party group works very closely on uh, the, with the all-party group on global health, and that places under, under Nigel Crisp, who used to run the UK's National Health Service, and that places a great emphasis upon joined up working, upon universal health coverage and so on. So yes, I mean, I have, I have posited that we should come together as, as one very big all-party group covering all these things, the risk with that is that then there is a dilution. So it's always the case, isn't it, that you, you, if, you, if you go in silos, you really concentrate and make great progress on individual diseases. If you decide to go um, horizontally with universal health coverage and health systems, which are incredibly important, you run the risk of dilution. So it's key that we maintain that balance. And I think the UK Parliament and those many MPs who are take this very seriously, are very well aware of that. Claudine, is that a tension that you see as well, trying to prioritise between different disease areas or the wider integration into the UHC agenda? Um, because of the big burden of TB and HIV in South Africa, yes, there's a lot of emphasis on that. And one of the things is the Department of Health has got a very strong malaria control programme, but we constantly then see how the context of the person, we're trying to follow how one health approach specifically in the endemic areas to see what is more the context of that person and what can be done with, within that. You, you cannot have an individual disease approach as such, so we're looking at the more holistic approach for that. Yeah. And Robin, I mean, Australia, there'd been something of a pullback, I think, hadn't there, in foreign aid more generally within Australia. So, again, how have you been able to sustain the momentum? What do you think is required to ensure that malaria and perhaps this integration into a wider range of diseases keeps support and funding and political momentum? Yeah, you're correct. There were some reductions um, three or four years ago, which are still, in a sense, working through the system. Though it's important to note um, that those reductions did not extend to the Global Fund. Um, and that's, I guess that's a case in point. It, it's not single disease, um, but it still has a very tight mandate. Um, and when you look at how lobbying works in the Australian scene, when you look at how parliamentarians organise themselves in the Australian scene, it's for the most part no longer disease specific, but there is a very strong, um, I guess, support group there for the Global Fund and the work that it does. So having a compelling narrative and mandate is the most important thing. It's not the single disease. Just one other quick observation. When you look at the, the non-government organisation sector in Australia, you do see, you see strong advocates for the Global Fund. You see strong advocates for TB control. Um, and you see strong advocates for um, HIV AIDS um, prevention and, and treatment, you don't find much interest in malaria control or elimination um, in Australia. And it's partly for the reason that I, that I gave. It's, it's not perceived as a big problem in the Asia Pacific. It is perceived as a huge problem in, in Africa and therefore you know, there's, there's no neat narrative around global elimination. So that makes it a difficult story to tell if you're an NGO looking for, for funding. And Alex, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? This is a common theme across all the 
participants here, there is that sort of cross-fertilization between the support for higher burden communities elsewhere, but a core expertise in R&D and development. We heard it with the challenge trials in Australia earlier with Kelly, of course, in South Africa and so on, across the UK, GSK and others that are very involved in here with MMV and others. I mean, how important is it to have the kind of, you know, the local benefits and expertise as well as the, um, the empathy, as it were, for other communities suffering heavily from the disease abroad? Yeah, that's, that's a very good and, and, and relevant question. I think on, on the one hand, we've seen with MMV as an example, but we know it from DNDI and other product development partnerships that there is a you know, very strong pillar of you know, capacity building, strengthening capacities on the ground, also in the R&D bed, and, and even, you know, increasingly into the, the downstream access factors that also matter when, when you want to deliver and place a product. So I would say this is one pillar, which we certainly from the Swiss side, you know, um, uh, appreciate a lot and, and also push throughout the PDP uh, landscape. The second thing is, and that's you know where we also, I personally you know have a bit of a trouble. I need to convince my bilateral colleagues to remain in, in malaria because you know I sort of cover the global health bit and it's a little bit more straightforward, you know, because R and D is globally organized, so that falls within in our competence. But we have all an interest to basically have also colleagues to work at national level and strengthen basically with national partners, you know, malaria control and even, you know, m moving into pre-elimination, elimination. So Tanzania is certainly a good example where we can you know, bridge the two and where a lot has happened throughout the decades and, and still malaria is part of our bilateral program with the government. And, you know, we've mentioned this with DPH, but the Ifakara Health Institute is also an organization which we still directly uh, support in Tanzania as part of, you know, building capacities in the country for malaria. And what I appreci uh, especially appreciate with that institute is that you've got the whole, you know, preclinical uh, expertise, but you've got other teams, you know, working on other access bits so they are perfectly aware of you know, what it takes basically to introduce products and what it takes to reach the patient and that the uptake is done in, a, in an appropriate way. So I think that the, the challenge going forward for us is really to maintain that base also at local level sort of a reality check, you know, for us as well when we go to a global fund and, and even to the PDPs, listen, you know, listen, what we see on the ground is that product A is not really getting into the hands where it's supposed to be, you know. Um, a last bit where we have been engaged a lot and where I think we bridge from the global, at least to the regional level, is what the colleague uh, from, the, from, from Australia mentioned. Uh, Switzerland is also very heavily involved in an African initiative to strengthen the regulatory authorities through a regional approach to basically accelerate the access to quality products by uh, uh, supporting, for example, SADEC, ECOWAS, or EAC in, in joint assessments of products to accelerate basically the approval and registration, which is a crucial part, as if we've heard yesterday and today. So here we, you know, we're even more concretely on the ground through that initiative in the various regions. And, and Jeremy, again, in the UK, is, do you think is that important, the UK scientific and technical expertise as part of making the case for support around malaria? and NTDs? I, I think it's uh, extremely important. What we have seen is a real commitment to investment in research, and I think this is one area in which we see re real um, support from the UK public for international development. When they see uh, the amount being committed to research and development on diseases, which in the case of malaria, it doesn't affect uh, many people in the UK, although sadly I've seen uh, one or two cases in my own constituency uh, in the past, but on, on diseases like HIV, AIDS, TB, and indeed with the increasing emphasis on, anti, on tackling antimicrobial resistance, I think the UK public and parliamentarians see this as an incredibly important use uh, of ODA. And when I hear some of my more sceptical colleagues in Parliament uh, speak about uh, the use of ODA, they usually make an exception for the kind of work that MMV does in research and indeed other research-based organizations like DNDI because they see the real effect of that and they see the value for money uh, that comes, most important of all, in terms of lives saved and lives transformed.
So we're moving towards the end of the panel, but I wonder if just the, the last uh, couple of minutes, each of you might just have a few final reflections about the message in terms to how to maintain momentum, political support, funding in your respective countries for malaria. I mean, we've, we've heard a lot about the, the vision, the bold long-term strategy, elimination, even eradication potentially. On the other hand, there's a bit of a trade-off perhaps with um, over-promising um, and indeed the need perhaps to remind people of the kind of the current burden and tension alongside the kind of progress and successes. So how do we get that balance right, Laudina? Um. One of the things is, if you look at the African countries, South Africa is the one country that actually got a very dedicated health innovation budget from our, voted from our parliament. And that enabled us to co-fund when we get money from MMV or from DFIT or from the EDCTP. And, and that just allows us to have a different kind of conversation when you start looking at that. And also it acknowledges your researchers that for the good work that they are doing. So to us to be a partner in all of these kind of um, activities is very, very important. And I think we, we can say that we have been successful to a certain extent, yes. Jeremy, going forwards. Well, I think it's, uh, I would say this, wouldn't I? But I, I think it's a, a case of involving uh, parliamentarians and through groups like all party groups, because parliamentarians, certainly in the UK, have a very close relationship with their constituents uh, because we have this uh, constituency system. And by, for instance, I found in my own constituency, gro groups such as Rotary, who've done a, an awful lot on, on malaria, are always wanting to hear directly about the work that is going on uh, on malaria, because they've been supporting that, and indeed on polio and other diseases which they've taken a great interest in. And when I speak in schools, uh, students are very interested in this, and they, they also welcome the fact that the UK is taking a lead on it. So I think it's often the, the importance of actually speaking on an individual or group basis to people locally, uh, rather than them just relying on what appears in the press with the exception of the Financial Times and Andrew Jack, of course. Which, <laughs> and again, I want to thank you for the positive case that you make through your newspaper uh, for this. And I think finally, just by concentrating on the, the really high quality work that is being done, it, it doesn't seem right to use the term value for money in this, this human context, but ultimately, that's what the multilateral aid reviews, the bilateral aid reviews concentrate on. They want to see impact. And MMV and all the other organizations represented here display really high quality impact. And I think it's our job as parliamentarians, or as an ex-parliamentarian now, uh, to get that over both to our constituents and in parliament. Thank you. Robin. Yeah, I think, again, coming from my particular geographic perspective, I think the most important thing is to um, tell the elimination success stories. Um, as compellingly as possible. Um, we will have a number of countries, most obviously China, but also potentially Malaysia, Timor-Leste, and others, uh, Vanuatu, that will achieve elimination uh, within the near future. And then there will be other countries in which sub-national elimination is, is feasible and likely to happen. So I think those stories really have to be heavily publicized, but also, um, it has to be made as clear as possible that the stories have a few discrete components. You know, there is support for health systems, there's support for commodity supply uh, through the Global Fund, and then there's support for product innovation and related regulatory work. And you have to have all of those things to achieve elimination. Um, so I think it's, you know, storytelling. Alex, a final brief word. Yeah, just three little elements. I probably uh, I, I continue where the colleagues stopped. So my my first thing, which I need to to, to answer the question, is why why us in malaria? Why us Switzerland? So the first question or the first answer would be probably something geared more towards uh, health security nowadays. To say, hang on, it's going down, but the war isn't won, and it can come to us more quickly than you think. With coming to the Agenda 2030 and climate change challenges and others. So we have, we have an interest at Switzerland to just remain on board and, and you know, even probably intensify our engagement. Second element is what I call the comparative advantage, make sure that Swiss actors remain 
uh, engaged in MMV in, in other endeavors in R&D and you know, contribute their know-how and resources. That was the second, if I can show that. Um, you can make the case. And the third one is probably going forward is even within malaria, um, coming back to the uh, value for money, uh, to make sure that we prioritize the right uh, products within R&D, even for malaria. So the, the question needs to be answered. Are we setting the right priorities in R&D? Is it a vaccine or is it another product for Vivex? What is needed? And I think WHO has done now lately through TDR really very nice work in terms of practical tools that allow you to analyze your portfolio and see what it takes, how much do you invest to bring that product through the process. Is that the right priority or do we need to shift at some, at some time? Also taking into account that there are other R&D needs beyond malaria. So if we can build that case, I can be ensured that we put the right priorities when providing funding to MMV and others, then this would help a lot as well. Thank you, and it's good to hear, even in this fractious political age, as Jeremy is saying, that there are certain areas like malaria, perhaps, that can actually unify and bring together organizations, politicians, civil society more generally around a, a common cause and focus. So do please thank our panel. Okay, so just before lunch now, briefly, we're going to hear a final um, set of reflections on the morning from Vivica Kashubska, the Vice President and Head of Product Development at MMV, who's going to talk about the organization's perspective on product development and the data gap that still exists. Thank you very much, Andrew. Can I have the clicker, whoever has? Thank you. And I promise to be brief because lunch is waiting. Uh, so, what I'd like to do is uh, build on the rich discussion that we've had by the panel here today and make a case, maybe a further case for innovation, uh, to, pr to provide more antimalarial options for pregnant women and lactating women, and also a case for more data collection and data sharing uh, for the same reason, so that women and their health practitioners can be uh, well informed about the medication that they could use during pregnancy. So to set up the problem or, or the issues surrounding, I'd like to take you back uh, maybe several years uh, ago where clinical trials for development of any medication and any uh, indication uh, were conducted mostly on male subjects and patients, which leads to the problem today, still today that uh, probably many uh, marketed in, uh, medications are not optimized for women. Um, in malaria, I think we've been doing uh, reasonably well to catch up, and our study populations are now well balanced, somewhere between 45 and 50 percent being women. Um, I think we also are doing uh, quite well to include pediatric populations, as was already mentioned in the, in the panel. Uh, we now are including uh, children in phase two and phase three trials, which means um, that when we're ready to uh, register a medicine, it is available for adults and children shortly thereafter. Uh, Puramax, for example, when we got the, the broader label for Puramax, was available for b both adults and children. So the last frontier that remains is pregnant women. And uh, what we're doing today is we're systematically excluding pregnant women from clinical trials, which means that we don't have data or knowledge at the time when we register. So medicines are contraindicated when they're first registered, which creates a gap, uh, a gap in medicines uh, available for pregnant women, which we need to close. Now, uh, the reason why we're not including women in, preg in clinical trials is uh, because of the fear to cause harm, particularly to uh, the developing fetus in the first trimester of pregnancy. But somewhat ironically, uh, women during pregnancy are taking medication. We know that for a fact. And many of the medications they're taking are simply off-label where we do not have enough data. Um, so, what MMV would like to do about this, well, by the way, the problem has been noticed by a greater community, and there is a movement to, to close that gap. Um, so, what MMV would like to do is to bring malaria and pregnant women 
at risk of malaria to the forefront of that movement, where we've actually formed a group inside MMV called MIMBA, and we're reviewing our strategies uh, to accelerate discovery, development, and delivery of appropriate anti-malaria options for pregnant women and lactating women at all stages of pregnancy. So I'd like to tell you why this is important. Um, because we estimate there are 125 million women at risk or pregnancies at risk around the world annually. And this is a number that we're using from 2007 or 2010 publication. Uh, and there's another case for more data collection that's badly needed to update those numbers. Uh, but we do know for a fact that there are zero approved medicines today to prevent malaria in first trimester of pregnancy. SP, which is a standard of care, or WHO uh, recommended, is to, uh, to be used in second and third trimester of pregnancy. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, that the problem has been noticed uh, by the world community, and the US Congress has mandated a task force uh, that is called PREGLEG for short, uh, of preg pregnancy and lactation. Uh, which has reviewed the issue and recommended uh, five, or excuse me, 15 points, uh, which we're now trying to implement. And many of them actually have to do with the way we develop drugs. So in the course of development, as I explained, where we're excluding women, uh, the case for innovation, which MMV hopes to join with our partners, is to actually do things differently. So first of all, um, to select compounds for development that have low teratogenic potential. Uh, then during translational um, studies, to use the latest technologies such as physiologically based PK to inform whether those adjustment is necessary for pregnant women. And finally, to actually collect data on exposure of medicines um, uh, in pregnant women during phase two or phase three development. And that would actually lead to having more data, more information, more knowledge to make medicines available to women, pregnant women, earlier. So while that is all happening, and we hope our partners will be joining us uh, in those efforts, what can we do still to improve upon what we have today and the tools that we have at hand? Uh, so here, there are also uh, different ways. Uh, first of all, we could still improve coverage of medicines that are approved for pregnant women so that all of them have the opportunity to use. Uh, we could continue collecting data uh, for, medic for medicines that are already on the market. So for example, through pregnancy registries. And we could also think of recombining uh, the combinations that we have, taking them apart and putting them together in such a way that would reduce the risk uh, to pregnant women and keep the, the benefit high. So what we're hoping with our partners, and we will be calling upon you, so you have been forewarned, to join us in this global effort to integrate pregnant women and lactating women in clinical research agenda, and in particular bringing malaria into that agenda, so that we can truly include all populations at risk of malaria and increase our chances uh, for malaria eradication and elimination. Thank you very much. Thanks. Ah, okay, apparently we have briefly um, an award, a little spontaneous extra thing that Kelly, I think, wants to present. So, Kelly. Between you and lunch, just uh, two minutes of your time. Um, this wasn't planned, it wasn't part of the program, but I'm doing this on behalf of my continent, uh, of Africa. So, this year we had 10 years of uh, working with MMV, and Team Wales um, came along and presented us with uh, a 4.5 kilogram of chocolate, um, <laughs> which is in my office, but it's not really in my office. That chocolate has now been transformed uh, into this that I'm going to ask, where's Tim? Can you come and receive this? Uh, is it gone? Okay. So this is the big five. The big five, um, you can see this is the chocolate that he gave me uh, that's now been transformed into the big five. So thank you to MMV for the tremendous um, help you've given us. Um, and on behalf of uh, 
the continent and, and my center. Uh, delighted to uh, congratulate MMV, 20 years, and uh, thank you, team, for all the support. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so after, after all this talk of chocolate, I think we have to move now from thought to food. So it is now lunchtime. Please be back by just before 2.30 so we can start punctually after lunch. Thanks all very much.